Hello, it's Cara Riley with the Landscape Photography Show. We're here with episode number 19, Understanding HDR Photography. This is going to be an amazing show. We're going to have the Tom and Kevin show tonight. Um, both uh, are curators on the landscape photography theme. And so we'll just all introduce ourselves and we'll get right to the show at hand. And we want to thank absolutely everyone who's been participating in our events with sharing your photography. It is incredible this week. And uh, once we introduce everyone who's here, then we'll be showing our show starters. So we'll get right to our, our hellos here mm -hmm. with um, Ankara mm -hmm. Riley uh, with the Photo Tour Global Directory. And then we'll get to Margaret in Kansas City, our illustrious leader. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Margaret Tompkins here in Kansas City. I'm retired and an amateur photographer and I just love looking at uh, landscape photographs. So I enjoy the theme and I enjoy this show and I'm just super pleased that we're able to do some HDR tonight, something I really want to learn. Great. Now we'll jump over here to Tom in the Carmel, California. Hi, I'm Tom Hurl, and as Kara said, I live in Carmel, California, and um, although I've volunteered to talk about HDR based on some of these pictures that have been submitted this week, um, I think somebody else should be talking tonight. <laughs> we got some very good submittals. That's great. Thank you. Now we're going to go all the way over to the other end in Arizona with Jim Worthman. Hi everybody, I'm Jim Worthman, um, an amateur enthusiast photographer and like Cara said, based in Phoenix and uh, you know, love to do black and white and color landscapes um, and uh, I'm really interested to hear Tom and Kevin tonight because I haven't done a whole lot of HDR so uh, tonight should be a good chance to learn some things. That's great. And we've got Kevin Rowe, Kevin in Utah. Yeah, I'm Kevin Rowe, and I live in South Jordan, Utah, which is in the Salt Lake Valley. And uh, my favorite thing is to go out with my camera gear and go on hikes and get pictures of uh, all the mountains and waterfalls and streams. And, and I love to come back here and share them with all of you, and I love seeing all your photos. So thank yeah. you. Well, that's great. Well, uh, we again saying thank you to everyone in the event, and this is a fun part of our show where we're going to share five show starters, which were selected from the photos that were um, submitted to our event. And uh, if you haven't gone to the gallery, I would highly suggest that you go to the gallery because people like Tom had mentioned who are very talented in HDR have actually shared how they processed some of their work. So Tom's got, or uh, Kevin's got this all up. I'm in a blue box over here, and we'll start right off. Yeah, and this first share is for, for Tom. Go ahead, Tom. Tom, you want to share about your about this uh, photo this photograph? And uh, I think that's that famous Australian bridge. Oh, it, is, it certainly is, and uh, I really like the reflection and the, and the colors that uh, Renee Kisselbach got in this, and this, this one really caught my eye, so I picked it as the starter for this week. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, that's beautiful. And Kara. Okay. We, I, <laughs> I can't see on my... Oh, there we go. This is um, Randy, and um, he, if some of you do Sky Sunday, then uh, you know who uh, Randy Schirkenbrock is, and was on our show for the um, uh, Google Plus two-year anniversary walk. But it, this just had some amazing light and some amazing lines and uh, really appreciate it Randy and appreciate you uh, supporting the events and um, sharing your lovely work. Okay and Margaret. Uh, this photo is uh, from Dave Tomek in uh, uh, Australia 
and uh, he's just a marvelous photographer and this one just so draws me in I love the water I love the colors I love those piers uh, it's just it's like I'm really into this photograph it's uh, amazing work and uh, uh, just a, a, a real show show starter here yeah Margaret and I also wanted to point out that you were the early bird because I think about four of us wanted to pick this photo so this one's awesome so <laughs> Uh, this one was my thanks choice. so much to Dave because he's really answered uh, absolutely uh, so many questions. And we have so many people from um, Australia. We were trying to uh, accommodate for live, and at some point maybe we will. But thank you guys for your support. It's wonderful. Are we ready for the next one? Kevin. <laughs> <Kevin's>, <laughs> Kevin had a gremlin. <laughs> Lost Kevin. So he'll be back. Sometimes um, on when we're screen sharing, I've found that uh, it just gets stuck. The screen share gets stuck. So Kevin, you have to close out and come back. Um, if uh, if if you're frozen there on time, so. Um, Let's see. You know, uh, Jim, you could just go ahead and and uh, share who who you had for um, uh, a show starter. <laughs> About the photo, yeah. And uh, so uh, the show starter that I chose was uh, from Tony Hayward. And uh, if if you were seeing the photo, it, it's really an unusual HDR, very natural looking. You'll see it later, I'm sure. Um, but uh, the HDR was was used to bring out some extra foreground detail, but it's it's still a very misty, uh, frankly low contrast uh, photo overall, which is unusual. So okay, great, and um, I know that the uh, fifth show starter, <laughs> and when um, Kevin gets back, we'll we'll be able to see them, but um, was Sean Hudson. And so if you go to the gallery, you'll be able to um, see all of these great shows or, or these great photos. Now, we also have, um, this is our first time, so, you know, guaranteed Google Gremlins will show up. But we do have the open um, question. So uh, if you have a question, then you'll be able to, um, <coughs> then we'll, you'll be able to submit um, any of your questions. <laughs> But as we have done in the past, you can also just put a comment in the um, in the event itself, and it's showing up. And Russ uh, Scullin is telling us, yes, I'm getting the same thing, Kevin Rose. Some of us are getting a black screen. So, well, um, we will uh, uh, hope that you're not getting a black screen, Russ. Let us know if you're still get okay. Um, because it, it seems to be rolling on this end, but we don't know what you're seeing. So Tor we'll just. Tori Boyd also is saying he's got a black screen, so there are two folks. Seeing well, a black screen. Let's go well, ahead with, with Tom's, and maybe Kevin can get back with us here. Okay, right. all right. So um, let me just uh, go ahead and tell you what uh, we'll be covering um, in the show tonight. And this is a, such a great learning opportunity. Margaret and I have been talking about this. Um, learn why and when to use HDR, um, how to capture images um, for HDR, and how to process the images. And there we go. We have uh, we have Kevin back. <laughs> when it freezes, that's all you can do, Kevin. We we just keep on going. <laughs> well, that was go weird. out and come back. You and, know, I uh, actually just had a power oh. surge come through, and that power oh. flicked on and off. So I hope that's the only one. And uh, if it's during my portion, then I'll apologize. But um, okay, why well, don't we... why don't I just share the rest of those uh, after yeah. after Tom? Okay. Go right ahead here. Beach Bum Brian. Thank you, Beach Bum Brian. Crystal clear in Hawaii. We appreciate that. So I think we're back on track. So are you going to show those real quick there, um, Kevin? Um, if, yeah, I can if you want me to. I didn't know if Tom had already started or not. No, no. He's just, just, he's just, just getting teed up. Here. Okay. 
Yeah, let me uh, get them up here then. It, this is what you get with live YouTube, right? <laughs> Gremlins and all. Okay, so where did I cut out? Uh, um, we have Sean Hudson and um, Tony to show. Okay. Give me one second here, and I'll... Isn't that right? Or have we, had, we hadn't shown Tony's, or had we? No, um, no. Jim just talked. We got, we got Jim's face for Tony's shot. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, right. so this one is mine, and this is Sean Hudson. And uh, I really like all the elements in this. I love the way he uh, put the, the sun right on one of those masks. That looks awesome, and it's a real good example of uh, HDR, but not taking it too far. So I really like that one. And then uh, let me pull up. Whoops, I guess that one closed. Sorry. Let me find. Uh, to Let's see. It was Tony, right? Yeah. And I'm not seeing that. Let me get it real quick. Well, we saw it. Oh, hi, Ray. We got Ray. We've got Steve um, Montaldo and uh, Dave. Oh, John Glasser. Uh, we got we got a viewing audience here. So <laughs> as soon as we get that put up, then we'll we'll go forward. Now, <laughs> Margaret, Cara, did you did you mention the uh, live comments? Have those been working? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and nobody is indicating. I'm, I'm seeing all the comments in um, in the event. If any, if one of you who is listening would tell us, is this looking different um, with the Q and A? Because this is Google just rolled this out last week, where we have the live Q and A, and I didn't know if it was any different um, from uh, what we had had just out in the event. And okay, sorry about that. That was acting a little strange. Okay. Okay. All the beautiful, beautiful uh, HDR images that people have shared, though. That was great. Yeah. Okay. All okay. right. So, yeah, here's the, the photo from uh, Tony Hayward. And, you know, this, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when you couldn't see the photo, you know, this has just a misty, dreamy kind of feel to it. Um, very natural HDR, uh, and and you can see the the it's fairly low contrast, even though it was uh, processed with HDR. And uh, it went off. <laughs> Great. Well, I think we're just going to go ahead and go right on over here to Tom. And uh, Tom, we'll, we'll let you start us off. We've got a couple of questions. I'm just going to read them now, and then I think we'll probably be covering them. Um, Richard Creamer asks, before blending, is it a good idea to push the lights and darks in each frame um, prior to blending or a bad idea? Um, so we'll hold that thought, Tom, because I'm sure you're probably covering that in your information. And um, then we'll just uh, go forward. Tom, take it away. Okay. Um, first, an outline here. I'm going to explain a little bit about dynamic range and exactly what that is, um, just so people understand it. Um, I know um, I want to start fairly simply tonight because I know a lot of people are new to HDR. Um, some of you more experienced people might be bored by this, but I apologize. But I'm going to start off just explaining dynamic range, explaining how the, the eye, the human eye, has a much greater dynamic range than your, your camera. And so what we have to compensate with, with the photography to um, replicate what we see with our eye. Um, HDR involves bracketing shots. I'm going to explain what bracketing is and why you want to do that. And then show some examples of shots that were taken that I've bracketed and then combine them using HDR software to combine them to, uh, into one shot. Um, some basics on how to bracket. And um, also I'm going to talk a little bit about sometimes you just can't take multiple shots. Maybe the, the, uh, what you're taking a picture of is moving quickly. And so you can actually 
create some virtual bracketing here using um, Lightroom, make some virtual copies, and process it as you would a, a regular HDR shot. And then to finalize, I'm going to talk about what not to do because certainly there's some things in that area that you need to be aware of. All right. Um, first thing, I just want to explain that the concept of, of stops or exposure value. Um, it's, a, I guess, a logarithmic scale. And so when one talks about increasing something by one stop, that's a factor of two. Two stops is a factor of four. Three stops, factor of eight, and so on. So when we talk about dynamic range in terms of stops or exposure value, please remember it's, it's log logarithmic. Um, I pulled this one uh, showing what the uh, light density of, of light, you know, we, we cover all the way from nighttime scenes just by starlight all the way up to a bright sunny day. Um, we want to take pictures over that range. Now that's eight orders of magnitude or 100 million times variations in the luminance density. And, you know, this is measured in candelas per square meter, but it's, it's just uh, uh, a measurement of the light density. And that, that equals total of 27 s stops. Um, and so there's a wide range of light intensity that we, we might come across in trying to take photographs. Um, if I look at a, a typical outdoor scene, um, sunlit, you know, middle of the day, there's maybe a 100,000 range or 17 stops between the brightest area where that gets direct sunlight versus something that's maybe, maybe in the shade. Um, as a comparison, the human eye, it's pretty good. It's, it's good for about 14 stops or, or roughly 10,000 to 1. So sometimes in these bright sunlit days, your, your eye adjusts to the bright sunlight, but if you want to make out something that's in, a sh in the shade, um, under a bush or something, it all looks pretty dark. You, you have to get really close to, s to see it. So the human eye is pretty good, but it, it, it has its limits in resolving your, your typical outdoor scene. A film camera, though, that's roughly 2,000 to 1 or 11 stops. It's, it's not as good as the human eye at all. And then the digital camera, that, that's somewhat worse than the film camera. That's typically 8.5 eight to some of the newer ones have gotten better. There, there may be 10 or 11 stops approaching film in terms of its ability to capture a dynamic range, but certainly far less than the human eye. And this is what we all struggle with, um, trying to replicate what we see with our human eye in terms of light and dark in, in a scene. And we get frustrated because in the camera is either shows up at all very dark and black or, or on the other end um, ver too much, too, too light and it get, it's blowing out. So this is what we struggle with and wh why we consider doing HDR just to try to replicate what we see with our eye. And then your computer monitors may be good for nine or 10 stops print paper is seven or eight stops, just, just to have some numbers there. Now, I also mentioned that the dynamic range is, is dependent on both the, uh, the ISO speed and, and with sensors. And I happen to print this out. These are for three Nikon cameras just because I, I have a D70 and a D700. And I know this is hard to see, probably because the print's small, and I apologize for that. The, the D70 was, is an older camera. It's a um, maybe six or seven years old by now. It's it's the um, the numbers in red, and so at an ISO of of 200, it's got a dynamic range of maybe maybe seven stops. Um, the D700, which is now I guess three or four years old, is maybe good for nine stops, and the D800, which is I guess the, the latest um, full frame sensor that Nikon makes, that's good for um, about 11 stops. So it's gotten much better. It's uh, and remember, I think film was about 10 stops. Hey, Tom. Yeah. When you say it has a range of seven or eight stops, d does that mean that anything lighter or darker than that range would clip? Yes, exactly. OK. And uh, what I wasn't aware of is how quickly it fell off as you, as you push the ISO. And so if you're trying to do some um, low light scenes, um, it, it's it's easy to fall off by three or four stops in terms of your dynamic range. Um, the good news is that the, um, the sensor manufacturers are getting better and better on um, building sensors at have higher dynamic range, so that, that's good. Now, 
if I look at my typical high contrast scene, and this might be outdoors at midday where it's a bright sunny day, um, my, my total light range might range over the, the 17 stops that we talked about. And with my human eye, with a, a 14 stop capability, I can capture the, the portion that's between the red bars. And, um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, in, in some of the darker areas under a bush or something or looking right up towards the sun, I really can't resolve that with my eye just because it's, it's too high a range. Um, so as good as the eye is, the, the digital camera is, is limited. So if you look at the areas between the red and the green, um, th those would be blown out or too dark on your digital image. And this, this is what we try to correct using HDR. Now here's an example of a, a normal contrast scene and I encourage everyone that's considering HDR to use your histogram because that, that'll tell you a lot of what the sensor is doing. In this case, you, you see the histogram on the right hand side there that pretty much it's all within the, the normal range of the sensor. There, there's no areas of, of black that you can't resolve and you know pretty much the white areas are all have, have detail in them. Nothing's really blowing out. So this would be your your normal contrast range, and you don't you don't necessarily need to do HDR in this to, to capture some of that. Next shot, though, this is a sunset shot, and this is just an extreme example where you have a, a very wide range because you're taking a picture right into the sun. So obviously, all around the sun, the clouds are all blown out because it's very dark, and at the same time, the the detail on the wood and the in the dock, it's all in black just because it's 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 um it is so dark and you can tell by the histogram clearly you're running off either end of the histogram with, with um, both light and dark you're not you're not resolving properly and so f for this you, you'd want to do an HDR shot just to try to bring out some of the detail both in the high and the low end of the of the, uh, of the range so here we have the problem with high contrast scenes is you have a wide range of light the camera has your seven or eight stops of capability, so that's the area between the green there. And you can see both in the dark area, the, the histogram, and the, the light area, the histogram, you're losing information, you're losing detail that just isn't coming out at all. So the way around doing way around that is you 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 try to take some bracket exposures. Now, if you tell your camera to take your normal exposure, it'll adjust, adjust the exposure to give a, a medium shade of gray. So it'll, it'll average all the, the points it takes and it varies on the type of camera you have, but its ultimate goal is to give you an average value. And in this case, I, I try to represent that by the, the green bars. And um, to try to capture more on the higher end and the lower end, you might want to have to compensate your exposure, bump it up one or two stops going up and one or two stops going down and that way you, you, you capture more of the histogram. You have three different shots here and if you combine the three you capture more of the histogram. Obviously the, the blue exposure where it's reduced by two stops um, you um, maybe I have my plus and minuses reversed here but anyway, you, you capture you capture some of the lost area by, by using this bracketing both going up or down. So I'm going to show some examples here. This is an example of the picture of the, the dock that was processed with HDR. And here you see there's more detail in the sky around the sun. It's not blowing out. And at the same time, you see the green there. So this is what you, you want to use H, HDR for, the high contrast scenes. Um, this is a shot that I took several weeks ago. And this is my, my standard exposure. And it's OK, but I was losing some detail in the fog. It was, it was on the light-hand side. On the, on the, it was a little bit too light. At the same time, in the rocks of the foreground, the, the dark rocks, I would have liked to brought out some more detail in, in the rocks themselves. So what I ended up doing was taking three, ex three exposures, a normal exposure, um, and a second exposure where I compensated um, one stop down, and then another exposure where I, I pushed it up one stop. So you, you can see, compared to the normal, one's darker and one's brighter. And um, 
by combining all three of those in HDR software, I'm able to get the shot here where I get more detail in the clouds and the fog, and at the same time, I bring out more detail in the, uh, in the rocks that were otherwise uh, all seem to be very dark. So, um, Tom, I have a question for, um, because I think that we're, we have some viewers who have never taken an HDR shot. Okay, and they're here to learn. So the sure. question is, on your camera, those three shots that you took, does your camera know to take those three shots, or did you technically have to change the settings for those three shots? Oh, well, let, let me explain then. You, you, it's a good lead into my next slide here, how to, how to take bracketed shots. Oh, great, great. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, First point is I, I suggest using a tripod because you have three different shots, th three, three or more shots. You can have up to seven or nine different exposures depending on how much you need to bracket. Um, um, these examples I've just showed three for simplicity's sake, but um, you could you could certainly use use more if you had a very high contrast scene. And so, as good as we think we try to be, holding your camera still for three or five or seven successive shots is very difficult. Now I've, I've certainly done some handheld HDR and the software tries to compensate for that by comparing the different frames and trying to line them all up and that actually does a very good job of, of doing that but I, I always believe if you can get it right in the camera you're, you're much better off instead of depending on the software trying to do it because it's, it's you're not always perfect with the software so if you use the tripod you have a much better chance of making the the frame, sure the, the frames line up properly. Um, the second point is you should use aperture priority um, and when you, most, most cameras have the ability to set up for do brackets it might vary from model to model. Um, for example with my Nikon cameras I can go up to a maximum of one, one stop but I can have a number of different variations I can do three stops all together, so minus one, zero, and plus one. I can do five stops, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. Um, but when it does that, um, I set it up to do bracketing because I'm working in aperture priority. The exposure time is varying. And you want to do that because you don't want to be changing your depth of field. If you're working in speed priority, um, where the exposure time is held constant, your aperture would be changing and you have slightly different depths of field which would, would lead to odd things I think when you try to combine them so you're much better off with aperture priority when you, you do this. Um, I have a question Tom here from, sure. um, Ray, from Ray Billcliffe. He says how many f-stops between each bracketed shot works best? Well Ray, I think it really depends on how wide of a dynamic range you have. Um, some of the shots where you're shooting sunsets and it's, the sun is very bright and you have a dark foreground, um, you might want to be covering um, either do uh, five or seven one-stop variations or if your camera allows you can do two-stop variations. Um, you know, some cameras don't allow the automatic bracketing more, you can only do three. Um, total pictures but lets you take bigger steps and I don't really know if there's a, an advantage for taking multiple smaller steps or you get to the same place by taking fewer larger steps. I've never s sat down and tried that. I, just because with Nikons I'm limited to a maximum bracket step of, of um, one stop, that's what I use and I either do three shots total, five shots total or seven shots total depending on my uh, you know what sort of variation I'm seeing, and um, you can you can also be looking as I mentioned earlier. The the camera will try to expose for a medium gray type of range, and you you might also combine your bracketing with an exposure compensation where you shift it. You maybe don't want minus one zero and plus one. Maybe, maybe want minus two minus one and zero as your three shots. Um, but I would encourage people to, to look at their histograms to see. Essentially, you want your, your range of shots, whether it's three shots or five shots, where if you combine them all, you're not hitting either the high end or the low end. 
you're, you're, you're capturing all the, all the light data. You're not clipping at either end. Tom, we, we, Tom, we have about 10 minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. And, and one other question, and we may not be able to answer this one, but how do you figure out the f-stop? I have an older Olympus in manual. It's hard to read. Hey, Kevin, you can weigh in on any of these. Or, um, or I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not sure there's a way, but I would have to know what what it is and research it. But. You, here's so, what I'm going to do. I, I'm actually going to send you to um, Alex McClure. He is an Olympic uh, Olympus uh, trailblazer, and he can answer that question. So I'll uh, answer and put his name into the answers there for you. Okay. And and Tom, I wanted to jump in with one thing, and, and we just got a comment that, that from Tori Voigt that's got exactly the same point, and that is um, wh when I shoot, I, I like to bracket a lot, and I've done three, count them, three HDRs. <laughs> but, but I never use the auto bracket, and on a Canon, it's maybe a little weaker than it is on a Nikon. But I always shoot manual and watch the histogram, and like you say, you know, just change the exposure from shot to shot, and I, I personally use one stop, one EV um, between each exposure, and shoot in manual, and just make sure that at one end I've covered all the, the darks. There's nothing, you know, on the, on the left side of the histogram up against the edge, and do the same thing on the other, and then make sure that, you know, I've got all the highlights off the edge, and that can take, you know, four, five, seven shots to do that. I don't pay attention to the aperture at all. I don't change the aperture. Oh, I'm sorry. I do change the aperture. I don't... No, no, no. <laughs> I don't change the aperture. I change the shutter speed, like you were saying. Yeah. But right. I do it just in manual instead of trying to use auto bracket. And let, let me just jump in and tell, tell you about how I would do it on the uh, Canon and the Sony. On the Canon, I actually set it up to auto bracket. I go in and I... And you can dial it... Uh, on the Canons, you can dial it anywhere from 1 to 5, negative 5, but it'll only take 3 in automatic. So on the Canon, I, I would always use um, negative 2, even, and plus 2. And that seems to really capture most of the dynamic range for things. And when I'm doing landscapes, my favorite thing on the Canon to do was actually just put it in uh, two-second delay and uh, push the button. You're on the tripod, your hands away, and it just takes all three of your exposures for you after two seconds. Um, on the Sony, it's it's pretty much the same thing. You can uh, decide on three shots. Um, so Nikon has an advantage there where they can do five and seven, but if you need more than that three, then just do it manually, like Jim's saying. You just dial in uh, exposure compensation. Yeah, I will say with the, the Nikon that once you, you set up for your bracketing, um, you have to press your shutter each each shot, so you have to be able to count to three or five or seven to, to make sure you get them all. I, I think the Canon, you press it once and it takes all three yeah, shots, that's... bang, bang, bang. Right. All right, um, mo moving on here, my next point is to try to use a relatively low ISO setting because I, I think most of the software tends to um, exaggerate the noise, and this is consistent. If you're using a tripod anyway, you can get, you can get away with a little bit longer exposure if the light is somewhat marginal. Um, you should be aware if you have movement in the frame, you might get some ghosting. So if, you, if you're trying to take a picture of something moving quickly, it's, it's problematic because you're trying to lay over you know, multi multiple frames here. Now, you always get a little bit of movement, wind or blow the leaves and that sort of thing. And the software has got to get it better and better to try to um, eliminate some of the ghosting. It will even allow you to pick one frame to be a reference point. And um, I don't know, Kevin, you're going to get into this at all, but um, you, you need to be aware of movement in the frame. It can result in ghosting. And sometimes that's, it's, it's, it's a, a nice, nice thing to add to it from an artistic point of view. It, it's, it can be very interesting, but um, it also you know, may be something you don't want at the end. Um, next point is check the histograms to make sure you've, you've fully covered the, the dynamic range. And I, I think we've mentioned this already. 
and you should either increase your bracketing to, to cover the range if you haven't gotten it or use exposure compensation to adjust your window, moving your, your entire window either up or down just to make sure you're, you're not clipping at either end. And finally, um, HDR, will, because it increases local contrast, um, it'll show up dust very readily. So if you're taking a picture of a sunset or something and you might have a little bit of dust in your sensor, it'll look a lot worse with uh, if you do HDR than, than, than normal. So. Um, one thing I found out the hard way. Um, just quickly now, you can also do a single exposure HDR. This is a, uh, a race car at Laguna Seca going through the corkscrew, and it's, I don't know what speed it was going through the corkscrew, but you know, relatively quickly, and this is your, your normal shot. Now, it wouldn't be practical to try to do three or five exposures with this, and just because the car is moving too quickly. And so what, what I have done is in Lightroom, I've created virtual copies of the initial picture, and then I'll, I'll change the exposure value of the uh, copy. So copy number one, I reduce it by a, a stop, and copy number two, I'll increase it. And I'll just take these as three separate shots, then run them through the software, whether it's photomatics or whatever, to create, a, I don't know what I call it, a, a pseudo HDR, but a virtual HDR. HDR, as you see here, you know you, um, you, you see a little more detail in the pavement and the dark areas. Um, it, it looks like a more of an HDR type of image with a contrast and, and whatnot. But that was done from a single image. Now I know there are other ways to do it, but um, I think some of the software will will do a single image process. But um, it's also if you work with Lightroom, if your workflow it includes Lightroom and then into the one of the uh, HDR software tools, you can do it by creating virtual copies. And if you shoot raw, you can usually push it a, a stop or, or so either direction. Usually the, there's enough uh, information there in the raw file. Okay, fine. Last slide here is things to avoid with HDR. Certainly, you know, people get carried away with the color saturation. It can look very unnatural. You can see some color shifts. Um, you need to be aware of ghosting for movement between the frames. Um, you also get haloing from 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 processing, and that's a, a dead giveaway. For, and um, certainly, you can have very dramatic skies with HDR. And you know, it depends on your intent here. Maybe if your intent is just to replicate what you see with your eye, you need to be somewhat conservative. But if you want to make it more of an artistic statement, you know, go for it with the sliders. <laughs> Do what you want. So. That ends my section now, and I guess I, I'll turn it back over to uh, Kevin. All right. Thanks, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, before, before we start, Kevin, let me just say one thing to the people ahead. who are, are listening, because we've got um, some excellent tips from uh, Stephen Kennedy on a Canon, on George Fletcher on a Canon 6D, and from Renee Kisselbach, so, and Steve uh, Montalo. So please uh, um, check the uh, event um, and uh, get their tips. And the three questions now, Kevin, that still need to be answered. Um, top software, please mention the top five to 10 HDR software tools. Noise, I've been having problem with added noise as well as edge artifacts, uh, similar to overlapping halos, but due to uh, not due to sharpening with my HDR processing. Any suggestions? Um, and also, before blending, is it a good idea to push the lights and darks into the frame? All right, that's okay. it. <laughs> well, I think maybe I'll cover all those. If I don't, then uh, okay, great. I'll try and come back with it later. But uh, okay, um, yeah, those tips on the on the page. Actually, the the one I George Fletcher mentioned that on the the newer cameras, he has the 6D, and they and Canon has allowed for three, five, and seven shots. So just want to point that out there. And then that other tip from from uh, uh, Stephen is awesome for Canon as well. So if you're shooting Canon, make sure and check that. So um, what I want to show is a little bit of going into the software side of things. And um, the question was 5 to 10 software, the top 5 to 10, and, and there's not 5 to 10. Um, there's a whole bunch of them out there that are mediocre, and there's some freeway wear out there that 
they're free programs and they're probably good, but they're because they're free, they're harder to use. Um, there's basically four um, options on the software. You've got NIC, which HDR FX Pro, which now you would just buy the entire uh, NIC software plugin, and that is $150 for all of the programs. Um, so that's that's a really good deal, and I find that NIC is the easiest to use out of them. The other one would be uh, Photomatics, and I also use Photomatics, and I used Photomatics for a long time before I I got the NIC plugins, and it's great as well. Um, it is a hundred dollars, and that that one works great. Um, the other one would be Photoshop. Photoshop does not work as well as those two. And the other one, I had it written down and I f don't know where it went, but it's uh, um, Olo Neo or something. And I've, I've heard great things about that one, but I have not tried it, so I'm not qualified to talk about it. So those are the ones that I'd check out. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to come right in here into Lightroom and I'm going to just, uh, I've reduced these down to small file sizes and I'm just going to show you kind of the basics of what you do in software to get these um, combined. And I'm not going to go into great detail. If you want some good videos, actually for, uh, for the Nick. HDR Effects Pro. If you go back and watch episode 12, we had uh, Dan Hughes from Nick Software, and he came in and uh, he did a great job of explaining that. Okay, so what I've got here is I just went through my photo stream and I found some pictures that I've never processed before. So um, I went through here, but I I bracket most shots that I shoot. So I don't use them. Um, I would say 75% of the time I don't use the bracketed shots making it into an HDR, but um, you know, it's a digital camera. We've got memories cheap. Um, might as well take them in case you need them later. So I've got, this is a taken at even. So this is a what the camera sees and exposes the scene at. Then we've got one that's two stops underexposed and two spots overexposed. So from Lightroom, what I'm going to do is select all three of the photos, right click, click on Expert, Export, and I'm going to go up here to Nick Collection HDRFX Pro 2. And that's just going to open up a dialog box. And this is kind of the pre-settings um, for it. So there's some main things that you're looking at here. I can't imagine anyone ever wanting not to check the alignment button. Make sure that's checked. Ghost reduction, um, like I said, I'm not going to go much into it, and I really recommend that you check our, our episode 12 with Dan if you want some information about ghost reduction because he goes into that at great detail. But um, what I usually do is I'm going to come down here, I'm going to hit this magnifying glass, and I'll go over sections, and hey, this hey, isn't Kevin? zooming in. Yeah, yeah go ahead. You're still in the Lightroom window. Uh-oh. Okay, let me switch it. I must have to... Sorry about that. I if I can just do that. Is that working? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. So here I am. Um, normally this... I clicked on this little magnifying glass here. Normally this zooms in quite a bit, but I've made this a small file so that it'll, it'll go quickly. Um, but you, what I'll do is I'll just go around and I'll check and see if there's um, any blurring images. Um, I'll look up in the trees and see if the, the sky is blurred into the, the trees. If there's cloud movement, I'll look at that. If there is movement, then you'll go ahead and click on the ghost reduction and then you'll choose which exposure you want to reference it up. And it's kind of just a trial um, going through and, and seeing which one works the best, but it works really well. So I didn't see any in this photo, 
everything so is... So, Kevin, cool. Kevin, there, there's one specific question about exactly what you're doing okay. from George Fletcher. He says, okay. what's the best way to reduce uh, haloing between the light and dark trees against the skies? I'm using Photomax and Lightroom. I also have on one um, perfect effect 7.5. Okay. Um, in Photomatics, I'll just answer that question real quick. In Photomatics, the only way that I've been able to find it to um, do it when you have a high contrast between tree leaves and the sky is to uh, uh, really minimize the strength of the HDR effect. Um, in this, you would go ahead and click Ghost Reduction, and I find that this program, the Nick program, works a lot better for that specific pr problem. So um, my advice would be either, and I'll show you when I get to, I'm going to actually show uh, Photomax in here in just a minute, and I'll show you what setting I'm talking about, but uh, maybe download a trial the Nick and try it and see if it, it helps your problem out. Okay, so I went ahead and clicked Create HDR, and what I do from that point, this is your this is your photo with the three exposures um, combined, and you've got these presets on the left hand side. You can just click on the presets, and it will show you what it does. Um, I typically use balanced, deep one or deep two, but there are a lot more in here. Uh, some of them are much better for buildings and things like that, but for for general landscape, these three work really good. So let's see. I like uh, that one. So let's go ahead and and show that one. Um, I'm not going to get too much into these settings, but I want to show the biggest advantage of Nick software versus anyone else, and that is the control points. So I, end, I like this. Normally, I'm not going to do much with any of the other settings in here. I'm just going to go back into Lightroom and adjust it, but with a control point, I can click on a new control point, and I can come in here, and it gives you all these options. And I might want to increase the structure to make the clouds stand out a little more. And what I really want to do whoops, is click on the uh, temperature and warm it up a little bit in that sky. And I mean, maybe I should exaggerate it a little bit to make sure everyone can see that. Um, sometimes it doesn't come across on the hangouts. You can really see it up there. And then I'm just duplicating this this point and moving it around here, making sure I get all of my sky. And I might do the same thing down here in the water. Obviously, that's too much, but I'm trying to overdo that. So. That's the that's the main benefit I think for an uh, HDR FX Pro over Photomatics. Now I'm I'm going to say I'm done here. I'm going to click save, and it's going to come back into Lightroom. And here's my photo. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the develop module, and I'm going to just do the basic things that I normally would do to a photo to make it make it look nicer. Um, the one that I really think you need to do is you need to decrease the blacks. Uh, and what that does is it puts some of that shadow detail back in there. The photo looks flat when it comes out of HDR software typically. And you want to just kind of make that uh, come back out a little bit. But that's the general, general principle of it. And you can see before and after just the a couple little tweaks make the, makes the photo look a lot better. Okay, now I'm going to show you one more real quick, and I think I'll just stick with the same photo, and I'm going to show you how I do this in Photomatics. I'm just going to right-click, select all three of them again, right-click, export, and then choose Photomatics Pro. You've got a few different uh, options up here. Now, Photomatics, on its ghost reduction, you can you can have it do it automatically for you, and it will it does a fairly good job. Most of the time, um, I found that the automatic works. Semi-manual, 
if you clicked that, it would bring up another box, and you would have to draw circles around the areas where you see ghosting. And that works well as well. So, I'm, like I said, I don't have any in this one, so I'm going to take that out. Another thing that sometimes help is, helps is to reduce the noise on the underexposed image. And that's for a little darker scenes normally. I don't have any problem with it usually. I like to keep, keep reduced chromatic aber aberrations selected and then automatically re-import to Lightroom. So I'll just click Export and that'll bring up the di dialog for uh, Photomatix Pro. And when I use Photomatix, and, and everyone's a little different on this, uh, Tom might be a little different than me, but I like to keep it really simple. I don't use hardly any of the options in here. Now, on that question about your, your leaves against the sky, I found about the only way to get rid of that is to reduce the strength and bring that way down. Uh, typically, if I don't have that problem, I like to have the strength up around 80, 90, somewhere in there. So that's that's one that I will change. And then the other one that I change is I like to click this little button here that says light mode. And that just gives you these options. And if you look down here, a minimum, that's going a long ways, way too far. So really the only ones I ever use are high and max because I want the photos to look realistic. I don't want them to look like this. And there are some photos you may want to go for that unrealistic look, but um, in a typical scene like this, I'm probably just going to go with max or high. So I'm going to go ahead and click high. And I'm going to ask you real quick, Tom, do you do, do, you do much more inside of Photomatix no, no, I don't. Matter of fact, I was going to ask you, you have a number of presets in Photomatix, just like we did in the other one. Which are your favorite presets? I actually don't even use them. Do you? Oh, I, I do. I, I, I use this smoothing or sometimes enhanced or sometimes the default. Yeah, I just use the default. Which ones are your favorite? The smooth? Um, the, one, you know, one or the other, the smooths or, or sometimes the enhanced gives it a little more contrast. Yeah. That's good. So I think I'm just going to leave it that. I'm going to leave it at high and uh, my strength at about 82. And I'm just going to click Save and Reimport. And that's going to bring it right back into Lightroom. And in Lightroom, that's where I'm going to just go back into my develop module and edit the photo. So I'll probably add a little contrast. Um, because I couldn't go in and do that selective adjustment up here in the sky, there are several ways I can I can do that. I can go in and I could get an adjustment brush and go brush it in. Um, I'll try here and just reduce the highlights a little more. And as you can see, that that brings it out real nicely. Um, and again, I I really love to bring the blacks down. Um, it. Uh, really makes it look like a more three-dimensional photo. So you can see just from a couple couple adjustments again, it looks much nicer. So let me just show one more here. I'm just going to show the, so this is the NIC software and this is the Photomatix. And you can see both of them I think work good. So I don't, I don't know that there's a wrong, a wrong set of software that you can you can get for this. Um, I will say though that for the $150 with the NIC plugin you get a whole lot more than just the HDR uh, FX Pro so um, I might recommend that if you're on a budget. If you, if you can, if you can swing it, I recommend getting both. Um, I have both. I bought them almost a year and a half apart so that makes it easier but um, I, think, I think we've got just a minute. Jim, why don't you uh, Share with us the, the ones that you've done. Okay. Um, sure. Let me share the screen. And, uh, okay. And I, I got to say, Kevin and Tom, those were, those were just amazing. I really love seeing your work. So um, here's, 
the first HDR that I did, uh, it's in Zion, and this particular one was uh, two images, and it, it's, uh, I call it HDR, but frankly, I used Photoshop to um, uh, overlay the two images and pick the sky and the highlights from one and the foreground from the other image. So my objective was to get a f one, one photo that really showed what it looked like uh, in real life. I, I wasn't trying to exaggerate anything. The, the clouds lit up, and it was just amazing. So here's a, a two-image HDR. Um, this was an experiment that I did using HDRFX Pro, Kevin, uh, and I do my processing in Aperture. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, this, this was just uh, to see, you know, what I could do with this very high contrast sunset. Um, this particular one was a nine exposure HDR. It looks like you got the hang of it real quick. Yeah. Yeah, that's gorgeous. Love that. Thank you. And then last but not least, um, this is a shot from uh, Lower Antelope Canyon. And the neat thing about the slot canyons is is it's such a huge dynamic range if you get any sky or if you are shooting the slot canyon but you happen to have some rock that's illuminated by the sun. So maybe no direct sky, but if there's daylight shining on the rock, you'll get huge dynamic range. So this one, I decided to try something really unusual and, and explicitly include a bunch of sky. And I processed this with photomatics and this is a seven image HDR uh, in order to show you know, the detail in the rock but also the sky with, with some very high clouds. Um, and, and that's it. That's the total of my HDR experience. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Thanks. All right. Well, well just great, real quick, uh, Tara. I, yes. you know, I, meant to, I really meant to uh, talk about halos and I didn't, but let me just say real quick that that is one of the things that you have to watch out for the most when you're doing HDR and um, typically it's going to be you know where a, a light area meets a dark area and you're going to have a, a big halo and you need to really watch out for that and you know there's more more information out there on that but um, the biggest the biggest reason that that will happen is you're just trying to do too much. So back off a little bit. Keep your you want to keep your HDR subtle. You don't want to go crazy on it. So anyway, thanks, Cara. Okay. Great. I um, um, have an HDR setting on my camera, and um, here's the what I learned. You must use a tripod if you shake it all. Uh, Tom was right about that. And uh, I think Jim saw one of my first one. He goes, so what are those little lines? I guess those were halos. But uh, that was because there was no tripod. So you, you just have to start somewhere. And we hope that um, we've brought... Uh, uh, some in, um, inspiration for anyone out there who hasn't tried it to at least try it. And you can rent a camera with an HDR camera and uh, try that too. So now we come to the end of our show where we have the photographers that are our suggested photographers to circle and watch and we share their photos. And we want to let you know that our next show is going to be October 8th and we will be having um, uh, um, Jeff Sullivan back. And um, so excited to see how to edit um, night photography. And um, so we're going to go uh, right now to um, Jim, and he will share with us. OK. Thank you. So I'm going to start with my recommended photographer is Franca Gobbler. And she is a, a photographer based in uh, California. Um, she's been quite active in the landscape photography theme. And if you look at her stream, you know, she has a really diverse uh, set of, of gorgeous work, um, you know, landscapes uh, both in California and Croatia, interestingly. 
and some cityscapes, seascapes, and just a, a really great variety. Um, and, and she does some abstract and impressionist work, color and monochrome. So I hope you'll check her out and uh, drop her a note, say hello, and, you know, follow her. Great. Thank you, Jim. Now we go, Margaret. Uh, my recommended photographer tonight is Brian Wilkins uh, out of Minnesota and um, he's uh, kind of unknown on Google Plus, doesn't have uh, too many followers yet, but he just does some gorgeous landscapes. Uh, here's one, I just love the lights and the reflections and it's like, I don't know which I like better, the sky or the water, it's just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, so he's one that, uh, uh, check, check out his work, I think you'll enjoy it. And he's also a frequent contributor to the landscape photography theme. And I think you have another one there. You seeing it, Margaret? No. It. Oh, it's a beautiful it. red flowers and purple flowers and a sunset. <laughs> We're seeing it. Okay, well that's uh, an example of his work. So uh, please uh, uh, give him a try. Take a look at his stream, and I think he's going to be a photographer that you want to follow. Good. There it is. I see it now. Okay, Cara. Okay, this is. Nicholas Papagalos Jr. from the Phoenix area and um, he is just an amazing photographer. Uh, we've just finished through the monsoons and he is so busy. He is the CEO of the PAC um, Photographers Adventure Club and they just are always having fun things to do so you might follow him and then check out if you're ever coming into the Phoenix uh, area all, some of the events that they have. Um, but this was the little bit of light painting on a um, yucca plant and uh, the um, wonderful electrical storm with the traffic. So we got some good action going there. And I think we have one more. Here we have the, uh, the iconic uh, up uh, by page, the um, horseshoe uh, bend and um, got some wonderful light going on there with the sky. So uh, again, Nicholas Papagalos Jr. and uh, follow him and check out what he's got going on with the pack and maybe you can come to some of their events. Great. Okay, Kevin. Okay, this is uh, Tony Phillips and uh, Tony is a really nice guy. Uh, he shares a lot with the uh, landscape photography theme and he comments uh, on a lot of people's photos and uh, he takes some great photos as well. So, And I think there's one more. Let's look at that. And that one, I, that's one of my favorites. I just love that photo. So um, check him out and follow him so you can see some more. Yeah, that's gorgeous. Love that. Okay, Tom. Okay, for my photographer, I picked um, Guy Schmickel from Sedona, Arizona, and I had forgotten we had somebody had chosen him at a previous show. But as as I look at his work, one thing I was impressed is just the consistency of some great of all the great shots. I mean, uh, I'm like many people get a good shot every so often, but boy, if Guy Guy has a whole series of great shots in his page. So mm -hmm. I would encourage people to look at look at his work and follow him. Um, yeah, here's another one, and I just love the reflection and the colors and the, and the sun on the hills here. <coughs> so, Definitely. again, Guy Schmickel for in, in Arizona. Thank you. Okay. Back to you, Cara. Oh, I am. Um, okay. <coughs> Are you down there, Jim? Yes. Okay, great. It was it was on freeze for a minute. Okay, so we want to thank everyone for coming. And remember, it's Jeff Sullivan. Uh, we'll be editing night photography on October 8th at 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time. And we sincerely appreciate each and every one of you contributing uh, to the event. 
and be sure and go through uh, the comments because there's a lot of learning tools people shared and thank you everybody for uh, sharing all those tips right in the in the comments and you all have a great week and we will see you on October 8th bye, bye. bye everybody bye, -bye.